So Bongo very rarely lets me down, uh, but yesterday we had a proper breakdown. Uh, this axle box here on the tender on the third wheel set has seized solid, and so essentially I've dragged uh, one of the wheels, one of the pairs of wheels, uh, an entire circuit around the railway. I thought that the brakes were hanging on a bit because I'd actually made some brake adjustments, so I had a, an episode of confirmation bias where what I thought was happening was not. Um, but uh, So I've made a flat on the wheels as well. So I've got to take this uh, wheels, drop these axle boxes with this wheel set out. So to make it easier to drop wheel sets from the engine, I've made this little uh, wheel drop here, and all I have to do is to uh, move the engine to there, and then remove these two little sections. It's one side out the way. So now I can just wheel the engine gently back over here and then it won't tip or anything because all the rest of the weight of the engine is holding the tender. It can't tip over. Famous last words. So. Now I can drop this wheel set out. I've done a little bit of preparatory work unconnecting brake rods and things, so I will just drop the wheel set out. One wheel set. I can do my exercises now. So this is the defective wheel set. This is the recalcitrant wheel set, we could say, using a good word. Um, so you can see on this side the axle box is completely free to turn, and on this side the axle box is seized. Um, so I'm going to take that down to the workshop and remove the axle box. But the thing that's uh, a bit of damage that's been caused is because it's been dragged around the circuit, um, you can see that it's formed some flats on the wheels. I don't know if you can see it, I've had to clean that with a finger. You can see there's a, a flat form there uh, on both wheels. So I shall machine those in the lathe and just sort that out. That will not take very long. The flats would make a horrible noise going around the track. We don't want that. So I've got the uh, wheel set in the lathe now. Um, one end's being driven by the truck, uh, the other end is running on a live centre in the tailstock, so that'll run exactly true as it was when it was made. Um, so the first thing to do is machine the, 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 the treads of the wheels. Uh, they're a little bit worn, um, but you can see the flat I've made there by running around the track with the wheels seized. Uh, it was a shame I didn't realise, but that's what happens. So there's quite a dent in it. I've put a little dial test indicator here, and that's set at, at five there. Uh, and if we go around there, you can see there's quite a dent in it. It's about 15 thousandths of an inch, or about 0.3 of a millimetre. So uh, that's plenty to remove, uh, but there's a bit worn anyway, so it doesn't matter. And all I need to make certain of is that both uh, wheels are exactly the same diameter, uh, otherwise they'll fight each other while going along the track. It doesn't matter in this case that these are a sl slightly smaller size than the other wheels on the tender, because they're not linked together like the driving wheels. Uh, so uh, the other tiny thing to note is that I've set the top slide here over to two degrees, and uh, that's the cone angle of the wheels on, on this engine. Two degrees is a fairly standard number, and it gives them a slight self-centering action. And when you're going around a corner and they run out to the outside of the, of the, of the, of the curve, then uh, this wheel becomes a little bit bigger uh, because it's running on a slightly bigger diameter. So that's the idea of the cone angle. We just take a tiny cut off just to cut the back. You can see that the tyres must be worn a little bit in the middle, where they mainly run on the track. So the profile has been lost with use. We get to there. And I don't really want to change the inside flange today, so I'm going to just get up to touch it. And I'm going to make a note of the reading on the top slide here. Well, it's at zero in fact, that's fine. So we'd better take a little bit more off. A bit of spring in the tools. We just take another few thou off. No, so little to take off. There's no point in trying to take it off in a big rush. You can hear the the flat.
Parts getting less as we get towards the wear in the middle of the wheel. Oh, nearly there now. I think we just take another five thou off and that'll probably get us there, I should think. Yeah, that's cleaned it up. Uh, I'm just going to... Uh, yeah, we got into the corner there nicely. I don't want to work on this flange anymore, that's just fine. So that has actually cleaned that up. Now the trick is to take the wheels out and switch them round with the other end. Take it out five thou at a time, just no hurry. We're not in a production machine shop trying to make money by doing things quickly. Done, so they're the same size now, and we just check that the flat has completely gone. That would slightly defeat the object. So while I was machining the wheels and the lathe here, I thought it might amuse uh, some of my readers. Um, here's Peter's Row and, and Molten Metal, and in this book, uh, Peter and Grandpa are machining the wheels for the little electric engine, and you can see that really the setup is absolutely identical to what's in the book. I don't really make the books up at all. So here I'm just machining a little uh, 30 degree uh, chamfer on the edge of the wheels. So having sorted out the damage to the tread, uh, the next thing to turn the attention to is to sort out this bearing. This is the one that picked up in the axle box. It's steel running in cast iron, which is a really good material. Cast iron is slightly porous and holds oil in it. Um, but we'll have to sort out the oil supply in a moment. Um, but actually, let's measure and see how worn it is. They were originally three quarters of an inch diameter, which is 0.75. And now they are, this one is... 0.74. So only two thousands of inches has worn off it in all the 20 years of running and this this slightly disaster yes and I'm feeling it all the way along the wear is about the same all the way perhaps a fraction more of this end. So what I'm going to do rather than machining it and turning it back to size which will take an awful lot off uh, or, or runs the risk of it I'm just going to um, polish up the surface a bit I've got some tape with some abrasive on it the blue paper is just to protect the lathe bed so from abrasive dust so it doesn't need to run terribly fast to do this and I'm just going to gently work away, keeping my hands out of everything. You can see where it's scored a little bit. And this looks a bit punk, you might say, but it will be, provide a surprisingly good finish and it'll still be quite round. And as long as I try and get it fairly parallel with a little bit of measuring, now there's little tiny grooves and it don't matter at all. They'll just hold the oil. But we'll make it a bit better than it was. Actually, it's at the very back there is where the damage has happened. That must have been the dry part of the bearing. We'll just give that a little... It's obviously worn a bit more there, hasn't it? You can see. So that really has pretty much restored the bearing there. It's a little bit pity where it picked up, but I think that doesn't matter. Let's see what the size is. We've probably taken only a thousandth of an inch off that, I should think. Well, one and a half there. That's absolutely fine. I think we just call that a day with that, uh, clean it all up, and now we've got to look at the uh, bearing in the axle box.
So this is the axle box from the failed side. Actually, there's almost no damage to the cast iron it's made from at all. Cast iron makes an excellent bearing material because it retains oil in, in the little cracks but where the, the graphite is. I'm not going to do anything with the bore in that at all. It's absolutely fine as it is. There's a tiny bit of clearance and where I guess if it all happens again, I have to machine the axle and then I'll have to machine out the bore here and put a new uh, sleeve in to, to sleeve it up to make it correct again. Um, but I'm going to leave that as it is. What's happened is my original plan for lubricating these was, and I, it's still carrying on, there's a little uh, flap there, just like on the original one, and you put the oil in the bottom, and then there's a, uh, uh, there's a felt wick uh, that runs up from underneath here. It runs up and it takes the oil up and it just rubs on the uh, axle inside there. And I guess the answer is that's not quite good enough. Um, when I made them, I did have a bit of doubts about that. So I put an extra oil hole in just there, which you can drip a drop of oil every run down there. So I think for the time being, that's just what I'm gonna do. Uh, I can put some oil in the felt part, but I'll just drop a bit of oil in there. These two little oil wells, they just feed down to a little slot that uh, lets the axle box slide up and down smoothly in the horns. So that's got nearly everything ready now. The uh, wheels have been remachined to take the flats out. I've cleaned up the uh, slightly scuffed up uh, axle end and I'm going to now just uh, completely dismantle the axle boxes and clean them in the parts washer to get any grit and muck out of them and then I can oil it all up and put it back together properly. So here's the parts washer. Um, it's just a, a brush with uh, paraffin that pumps through it and so I can use that to get all the muck and dust out of there. So we'll just do that, it makes a horrible noise. So yeah, there's a quick blow off of the compressed air line, it also gets any muck out of the little oil passageways that you can see in there. So a little bit of reassembly work now. All of this has been wiped nice and clean, but just check the bearing again. Bearing nice and clean. Bit of oil on the bearing. Oil in here. Way around there, right, that can slip on there then. Right. That's in there. Then what we want to do is to put uh, some oil down where the little wick is going to go. So there's the little wick. Push that in. Push it in there. That's it. The little spring that holds it in and the little cap that pushes it all together. Let me just do that. It's in there. That's okay. We do the other side. Right, we put a drop of oil in there because that's where it's meant to be oiled. Okay, so now all I have to do is to wiggle these back up into position keeping the axle boxes straight when I do it. I might try and get this one in first. Now just to start. It's quite heavy working upside down on your head. Does it go in there? Great. Right, that's got that one started. Now, right, the other one. Okay, that's then started. Right, now it can't fall on the floor because that side is held. I'm get the nuts onto the backs of the bolts there. Sort of working blind doing this. 
So that's got the horn keep back under there. On this engine, the horn keeps just stopped the axle box from dropping out. On the full size engine, what they did was they actually uh, held that gap across the horns there where the axle box slides up and down because the forces and the masses and the weights in, in the engine would maybe try and uh, distort the frame. So the horn keeps also uh, strengthen the frames just to that opening there. That's that side in. Hopefully it spins nicely. Yes, it spins beautifully. Um, and the next job is to assemble the brake gear. So now it's just a question of reattaching the brake rigging. So I've had to remove these here in order to get the axle out. So this can go back up and attaches on there in a moment. I think before I do that, oh, I'll take these two pins out. One, these little pins that go in there, put them down there. So they go back through that and that, uh, that and that, that's where they go. Right, that's got that pin in. Let's see if we can get the other one in. The brakes on the tender are compensated so that the front rod that pulls from the brakes into all the handbrake uh, has only a third of the pull force. And then this one here divides it in two. So that little compensating beam there, here's the puller on her. So half the load goes into this one here and the other half goes to the back one. On the driving wheels, it doesn't matter. It isn't compensated on the driving wheels because they're all coupled together anyway. So you can't lock up one axle uh, without locking up the others. So, but on the tender, one axle locking up would spoil it. A bit like we've seen earlier on. Right, a washer and a split pin. A washer on that. It's a bit oily so that won't drop off with a little bit of luck. Washer on there. And split pin, that's going to make life easy. You could argue if you wanted to make life easy, don't make model steam locomotives. Right, well, that's all the brake rigging back together again. So, and that all turns nicely. So that's the wheel set back in. Uh, all the brake linkage is uh, reattached now. So now all I have to do is to push the locomotive across the gap. And reassemble the gap. Reassemble the wheel drop, perhaps I should say. So that is uh, the wheel drop put back together again. The engine can now roll in and out quite happily. And the wheel is rotating, which is a good thing. So the last thing to do is to have a steam test and try the engine out. But it's getting a bit late tonight, so that is tomorrow's job. So having done all the repairs on the uh, axle box on the tender, it's time to have a steam up and check that the engine's running properly before visitors tomorrow. Small fan lifting the fire, fire lit, water in the boiler, no pressure yet. These are the original boilers which go up through the wick, which is not necessarily terribly effective. But from now onwards, I'm going to make a point of putting a little drop of oil just down into the holes there, directly on top, straight down into the axle box straight down into that bearing. Well, here's an interesting railway lesson learned. Uh, it's obviously very important to finish a packet of biscuits once you've started them. Uh, obviously, we had eaten uh, some of these biscuits on the railway one afternoon, and then I think a small furry animal has helped itself to what was left there. Always finish a pack of biscuits.